Hey, Joe, I am sorry. Everybody. Five years you never heard me bring a cow here, did you? <laughs> I can't get rid of them, I guess. Yeah. What can I say? Sorry. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. Um, let's start with the approval of the minutes. Has anybody, everybody had an opportunity to look them over? Is there any questions or additions? Not hearing any, do I have a motion to accept? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. EP1, resolution designating various um, snowmobile trail improvements type two actions under New York State. What this is, is whenever our um, snowmobile clubs that we help out and they ask for money for us or uh, we assist them, if they're going to change it at all, it has to go through a secret thing, unless, and that's the biggie, unless it is a regional thing, it's only used part of the year, it is an accepted snowmobile trail. That definition means that it doesn't need to go through a seeker, but the state requires us to claim that yes, that it is not, it is only a seasonal, it does not have any major environmental impact, and so then we just acknowledge, yes, it is that, and so then we just have to say that you don't need to have the seeker, it's one page that they do. And then the um, chairman will be able to sign off. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Are there any like to open it? Motion to discuss. Mm -hmm. Second. Any questions? Motion to approve. Oh. I have to. Oh, that's right. We do have to amend. Thank you. Um, where the amendment is, and that's that extra piece of paper that was sent around that it just starts with whereas on the top. What that is, is last guy decided to add another little section. And so the on that sheet of paper, it's the one, two, three, four, five, sixth whereas, we're simply adding another at the last guy Boylston Snowmobile Club being a domestic not-for-profit corporation with its principal offices located at 5001 North Jefferson Street, Glasgow, intends to establish an addition of 1.6 miles to trail C5E. This takes a trail from non rideable road and moves trail to the woods. So that is what they have requested for us to amend so that it's all in one resolution. Now, can I have a motion to amend? Second? Any questions or concerns about amending it? All those in favor? Aye. Amendment is approved. Now we can vote on the um, resolution as amended. And um, can I have a motion? Second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Moved, so amended. EB2, we've gone through this now. This is the resolution to add um, agricultural district boundaries for additional areas. This one is <clears throat> this is just adding anybody who wanted to add to the um, our existing agricultural district and I have a whole packet here of everyone that was going to be added to the district Paul is not here I thought he might want to give something but he can go further into it um, afterwards in the reports so this is everybody that has applied to us our meeting we met and we went over to make sure we, we had real property with us and cooperative extension. And we had the Farmland Security um, Protection Board. We met, we went through all of these. They are all agricultural lands. They are within the district and we approved them. So are there any questions of any of these that anybody else would like to look at before we approve? I just have a question. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, I'm looking at the back of this. There's 32 new applications. 32 new applications, and that's okay. Well, we don't have the entire list, so it's entire anywhere, right? No, it's like a thousand. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about it, but it's like thousands. Okay. Yeah, this is just those that want to add to right, the no, existing, and it's that. the only time of the year. We only one time a year every year that they can. Every eight years, right? No, it's you can add, you can add every year. You can add every eight years. You can get out if you want. Okay. And that's the only time. We only have two that decided to get out. I see a list of three on the back. Three, I'm, is there yeah. three? 
Yes, I think there was some. the same person, just different parts. That's okay. That's I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. That's an excellent. Yeah. Any other comments? Questions? All those in favor of accepting these? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. EP3, adopting modified agricultural district and finding that the proposed district will not have a significant environmental impact. Now these are kind of confusing the way they say these because it's like one was supposed to be the eight years. It says permitting additional. And then the second one is finding that the proposed district will have not have a it's almost You see what I'm saying? It doesn't mention the eight year. I just realized that. I've seen this so many times I didn't even realize that this one doesn't mention it's the eight year taking off. And I apologize that I didn't look at this. I've seen these two egg districts so many different times. So does it need to be amended to say something that it's the eight year? Why does it matter? It's just, a, yeah, it's just a modification. Just it says that the resolution is modifying it. Mm -hmm. As long as you're moving it, it's an acceptable modification. I would assume this is like we used to have. Well, there's just three of them that are coming off. Right? There's just three coming off. Yeah. So we don't need to amend or I think just that it's modified? Sure. Okay. Do I have a motion to discuss? Mm -hmm. Second? Okay. Any other questions or concerns about accepting it as written? I would think that would have to say that they're being removed specifically. I think we should amend it. Yes. Because it does. It just says modify. What does that mean? It's not clear. So why not now modify it to say these properties will be removed from the ag on request? You know, something like that. No, I think. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what I was kind of throwing. It's, it it's kind of leaving it up in the air as to what the modification is. Yeah. It's a modification to add. It's a modification to reduce. Right. Right. I would suggest that you amend it. That's just my opinion. I read through it. I don't see where it says they're being removed. But no, because it's actually, modifying the list, and the list is just going to be shorter. Right. Yeah, because the first one it is to um, regarding inclusion of right. parcels, and this one is just modifying. To say modified by removing from the farm. My thought. Anybody else have any thoughts? Do you feel we need it or do you think it's okay as it is? If there are specific properties being removed. Yes. Is that in, that, in that first resolve, it should be the district should be modified instead of as proposed, modified for the removal of the properties identified on attachment A. Rename this attachment A. Okay. To Oh, what, does anybody have any other thoughts that we change this to read that as? I'll make a motion to amend this pass. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we can have a vote now to accept the resolution as amended. I have a motion. Motion. Second. All those in favor of accepting the motion. The, the resolution as accepted. Oh my God! I'm sorry. This this phone is really throwing me off. Okay. Anyway, all in favor of modifying the resolution, amending the resolution as Bill has said. We already voted. On. We voted on the amendment, but now the resolution as amended. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passed. Um, okay. For just a procedural no is it, is it typical to um, make a make uh, motion for the resolution to discuss before we amend it yeah that, that opens discussion on it and then if during discussion someone wants to modify it then we do a motion to amend so on two of them we just amend it before we had a motion to even discuss the first one so you want to do that first okay see I thought that I opened up Should discussion Oh, oh, okay. No, you we only did the motion after oh, to accept the resolution. I know. All right. No, I, I appreciate the, the, the context there. Thank you. 
Well, and even when Mark was asking a question about the, the other one, we didn't, we didn't do it till the end. So if you do the make the motion ahead of time, then you once you have it on the, on the table, then we can discuss. And then we can amend. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rule supporter. Yes. I know. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Don't be sorry. No, because oh, we need to make oh, sure that we do follow the policies. There's a reason for policies, and I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm learning because I'm going to do good discussion. There you go. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. You know what? Watch yesterday's human services. We knocked off 17 of them in a half an hour. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The record. You're going to rock, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> here, here. Okay, we have um, EP4. Everybody's got the EP4 in front of them. What this is, it doesn't cost us any money, but what this is, is in order for the chairman to sign off and to request an extension on contracts from a grant, we need to have, DOT says we need to have a resolution to allow the chairman to sign and to request an extension for this grant. Therefore, you have the resolution in front of you. And what this is, is there's seven, it is one grant from DOT, there are seven contracts, and all of the contracts added up are to 1,401,350. Of those grants, of those contracts, there's still $946,550 still out there that the state has for us. So we just have, have not spent the money to ask the state to reimburse us. And I'm actually kind of glad that we got this um, because it really begs the question, you've had six years to spend this money, yet we still have almost a million dollars on these grants that haven't been spent. So it's like, I wonder, does this happen to other grants that we have, Phil, that we have oh. so much money? Oh, wait a minute, I, yes. Thank you, motion to discuss, second. Uh, no, this is um, this is required because the state is requiring a resolution to extend grants. Grants that are not fully expended at the end of the year are the revenue is rolled over if the grant source allows it, so that the grant work can continue in the following year. Um, there are some grant. It depends on the policies of the grantor. Some some grantors uh, allow you to keep any money that's left over. And put it to something that is related. Others want it back, which is rare. But we usually expend it all. So we usually do expend it all. Right, but, it, but they can roll from year to year, so you can continue the grant. Okay. Until there, unless there is a, unless the grantor has a deadline on which the work's going to be completed. And this would be the deadline. This is one that has yeah, a deadline. This is one that's extending the deadline. Yeah, this the extending the use. So. Okay. Do, Just seems. Just seems like six years is a long time to spend this money, and we didn't spend it. And that means there are services that our residents didn't get, or didn't demand. Or didn't demand. But that's a lot of money that's out there. Yes. Ben. Do Do we have those funds? If the state has it. The state has it. Yeah. So we just if we if we expend it, and we, uh, then we can send them an invoice, let's say, and then they'll pay us back. And I know there was this one was a little bit large because it was a couple of years we didn't have a vendor for mobility management, right. and that's what some of it. Yeah. But I still question the fact that we weren't able to get buses because I know we needed buses, and I don't understand why we didn't buy the buses at a lower rate. The county owns some buses of their own, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So do, are these funds used for our privately owned buses and with contractual buses that we see. Heather, she's our mobility management and she can give us right into it. The, um, the county owns eight buses and so this funding is used to support those eight buses that the county owns. Um, there is enough funding in there to purchase for lot I buses. Um, so that's what I hope we can use the money for is to get those four lot I buses on the road. What's an I-Bus? It's a, a lot I-Bus is a 20 passenger uh, bus. Much more reasonable size than what's flying around. We currently use uh, the eight buses are 16 passengers so this will allow for more public transit riders 
What about the buses that I see all the time that are empty going through our road? I complained at one point, and then they tinted the window. <laughs> um, the ghost buses. The ghost buses. Because they're certainly going around, and they are most certainly empty. My neighbor rode the entire route for one day. Heather, you have any comment about those buses? Yeah, so during my update today, I'll talk about rebranding um, to help with ridership, but it could be one of two buses that you're seeing. It could be a public transit route bus, or it could be an access bus, which is an on-demand service. With that service, you may see the buses empty periodically in between pickups, um, because those are scheduled rides where the bus will go directly to someone's home, and I'll also elaborate a little bit more on that later. Um, but ridership is something that we definitely need to address. You know, OPT 12, which is a central square route, we redid that route last year, and ridership has increased over 130% since that route was redone. We need to take a look at the remainder of the routes, gather the data so that we can update those routes and make them more effective. One example of an update would be uh, Sarah Sunday is working on a congregate mill site in the Flash Day area. This is a great opportunity for us to use public transit routes 13 and OPT 14, which have lower ridership because they're up in that area. Um, so those residents can take those public transit route bus to now get to the new congregate hill site. So we'll coordinate together with other organizations with, with projects like that to help increase the ridership. Last question, do these buses routinely take people around your jobs are like so we have a lot of options for buses to go around within Oswego County. It can be a little more challenging to move people outside of the county, but we do have programs that can take people outside of the county for employment. We also can connect our public transit buses from going to from OCO's buses to Centro's buses, which do go into Onondaga County. Well, this would be within the county. Yes. Yeah, so I just wonder if there scheduled work sites that there, there's an opportunity to get people to work sites. Employment is a huge factor. Um, transportation does focus on employment um, locations, but we do need to take a look at the routes. There's OPT um, 10, 11, uh, 13, and 14. We need to redo those routes and focus more on employment locations, but also Fulton and Oswego are heavily covered through Centro, and Centro stops more periodically in those two areas, and so those areas are going to be more focused on the Centro line. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we focus on employment all the time, and I get calls for employment. I've been working really closely with workforce development, and I've uh, been on the bus in my first month four times with people uh, getting to workforce to help. I also gave a presentation to Amazon last week. Um, I'm working with Amazon. They're going to send me a list of their um, zip codes that have the highest amount of employees in certain areas of our county so that I can send them an easy-to-read bus guide for those areas of high employment. So I'll continue to do things like that to help people get to employment destinations. We need to focus on employment. Roy? Well, and you're right, and it's, uh, that is a focus um, that we've talked about for a while and that I've been working on. It. So, uh, we're going to keep an eye on trying to, um, in my mind, create more, uh, more more opportunities there on a daily basis, to, you know, where you know where you could use it every single day to get back and forth to work, as opposed to the, some of these routes are sort of hit and miss, you know, like, or you know they run you know twice a week. That's just not adequate. Um, so we'll we'll be talking about that in the transportation. Advisory committee meetings and trying to trying to improve that over the year. I, I, I would agree, Brian. I mean, if we're going to expect people to use these buses, then we have to be reliable. If we're not going to be reliable, then there's not going to be a following to follow the buses people and rely on. Well, it's something we've been something we've been trying to focus on for a long time. I mean, it's been my focus for a long time. But it's hard. This is it's a uh, it's government, and you just look even just looking at this this uh, list of grants. Uh, the funding sources for this, it's its really complicated. It's a lot like the Workforce Development Board. You know, you got federal money, you got state money. We got to fund this stuff, we got to make a plan, and we have not done a, a great job in the past, frankly, and we've known that for a long time. And having Heather finally on, um, who is, in my mind, doing a fantastic job in, uh, 
and we've got to keep an eye on the ball. My idea basically is to say we've got to be able to go back and forth between major and minor hubs and then pick up that last mile thing, you know, so that we're just, if we can run back and forth between Central Square and Fulton, um, you know, in the morning and in the evening, or maybe twice in the morning, twice in the evening, and people know that that's going back and forth, that's, that's what a bus route should do, and it should do it every single day. Um, I don't know, you know, we don't really have the capacity to do that right now, but we're working on building that capacity, and that's going to be important for, you know, Micron, for Amazon, uh, for Novellus, for all of our, you know, major employers, if we can do that. Um, so that's, that's a goal. That's what we're shooting for. But Roy, may I ask one more question? We're not expanding the county buses. I mean, that would be more something for the private sector, correct? Uh, well, I mean, I think part of the problem, and, and Heather mentioned it, is ridership. So we were in sort of a death spiral over the past few years where people weren't riding. Like you said, people weren't on the buses. And when you don't have people riding the buses, you can't get as much money to, to do buses. So now we're trying to build that. Um, as we build ridership, um, we can build capacity, and now what it is really, it's taking what we already have and figuring out how to reroute it so that it makes more sense. Uh, you know, and then then we can build on it if it's working. Um, so it, it's it's complicated. Um, you know, it's it's there's a lot of moving parts, uh, but we're we're working on it. Yeah, I'm sure Heather will be able to expand on that um, after yes. with her report. So, is there any other questions regarding? giving the chairman uh, the ability to cite for um, the extension. So did we move this for, did we make a motion for this one? Yeah, do it. Not to vote on it. Not to vote on, we're still in discussion. I did open it up for okay, discussion. So we have, a, we have a motion on the report for it. Um, why are we getting this now and why do we not have any information about what each of these grants are? Uh, you know, um, I don't, I mean, the fact that we're just trying to get money uh, is great, but um, that's not a lot of information yeah. to um, get it thrown in our laps. And, yeah. you know, and, and if I could, um, I want to apologize for the lateness of this resolution. Um, it was the understanding that there was not a requirement for a resolution, generally speaking, when a grant is looking to be extended, it doesn't need a resolution. It needs a chairman signature. DOT is a little bit different than any other state agencies. It does require a resolution to accompany the chairman's signature. So the chairman has actually already signed the extension request. That's all that we thought was, was needed for it. Um, when Rich reviewed it to notarize it, he said that um, there's a, he believed that there's an additional requirement uh, that the legislature have a resolution. And so that was why I went the late uh, that. I wanted to also speak to what is included in this grant. Um, there is a breakout that we have, I will tell you, and to uh, Chairman's point, um, this, is, this is old. I mean, this is money from 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay? So it, it's a fair question. Uh, it's, it's the right question to ask. Um, what I can commit is that this money will be spent this year. Um, I fully expect to have it fully spent. Um, it is for a number of things that you probably expected to be for. We've seen this throughout the years in this committee. These are the types of projects that transportation is funded uh, directly, either federally or state funded. So there are things like uh, bus facilities, rehabs, training room, uh, bus facilities training room. It does also pay for the mobility management money. Um, replacing a couple buses was included in here. Some shop equipment, route signage, or hardware. So it's, it's majority of this is some di diagnostic equipment, tablets uh, to be used out there, and then again, the majority of it is, is uh, mobility management for each year. So this is 2017, 2018, 2019 mobility management. So the requirement will be that we get this money spent and reimbursed. Uh, it, it, is, it is an older one. Do you understand that? Yeah, I'd like to be able to know that this, that within a year this will be spent, and it's not when he gives us an extension, but it is a night, an extension for four more years that it is actually being spent. And I, and I will, support. Absolutely, and I will tell you, I have a phone call with DOT this afternoon to discuss exactly what needs to be done to fully expand this and, and close it. So I will be happy to report back to the committee. Right. And I am very pleased that Tim and Heather are working on this now because it's yes. not something that we have been able to get a handle on for a long time, and now we're getting a handle on it. We're going to improve dramatically. Thank you both.
well, it's called catch up here. So we can do it because I know we've gotten DOT funds after that. So I don't even know where they're at. I mean, our, it would, I wish there was some way that we could say, okay, you've got a grant that's four years, you've got to spend it. There should be a red flag after two years. It's 50% of it spent. Another red flag at three, three fourths, is it spent or are we not spending it? Why are we getting grants if we don't have the administration of the grants? So it would be nice if we had a clearinghouse of all the grants in the county. I just had a question, are these grants that are reimbursable or do you get it up front? Because I know a lot of times with our issues on, on other grants that you've got to spend the money first. Well, you've got to come up with the money to then be able to, you know, to bridge it to then be able to get the reimbursement. So I don't know if that's an issue with these, but I mean, there's, a, there's usually always a catch or some sort of a, a string attached with grants that doesn't make them as easy to spend as, as we want them to be. Is there any other discussion on letting the chairman then sign it? And we can go forth and discuss grants at another time. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. Okay. Let's get into then our reporting departments. Um, soil and water conservation. <laughs> Uh, just like to give you a brief update on some of the things we've been working on over the last uh, couple of months. And first, I'll start with uh, the education, which is uh, the big event that we just had was the Environathon. And that was held on May 4th at Camp Hollis. Uh, great day. There was actually there was participation from seven of the nine school districts uh, throughout the county. So we were quite pleased with that. And Oswego High School was the winner. This is the <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 31st annual uh, Sweden County Environment. And second place was G. Ray Bodley out of Fulton. Uh, third place was uh, Altmar Parish, Williams County, PW. And <clears throat> the, um, the winner of that uh, that event, so just a, a brief, you know, brief recap of what that is. It's a high school competition. They, they take, uh, they study, you know, throughout uh, the winter, you know, winter and spring months. Uh, they take tests in several different uh, you know, fields, environmental fields, forestry, soils, aquatics. Uh, there's a current issue in wildlife, so the five categories. And they, um, you know, all of them do quite well. They have to know a ton of information. Awesome event. Great to see if you do get a chance to, to get out there. And excuse me, um, from there, we, they do go on to the state competition. And that was a Swedo that attended that on May 24th and 25th. Uh, they did fantastic. Seventh place out of 42 teams. So oh, excellent. It's got to be one of the highest, isn't it? I think so. We, I think we, we have seen, uh, I think, tied for maybe second, uh, somewhere around you know, third. But we have a pretty pretty decent history of placing in the top ten. So, we're, you know, you never know. You know, you sit there. Um, we had uh, two staff members at the time. You know, they're... You know, you just sit there, you hear the hear the results, and then you know it's always a great, uh, you know, great feeling here at Sweden County. Don't we have that team uh, come up here in uh, front of the ledge? Don't we here, acknowledge I, them at some point? I think it's the, the next uh, full legislative meeting, and Erica did submit um, some information for the proclamation. Uh, that, that, that yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right, excellent. So uh, next up, I'll just go over a few of the, the other updates, some of the things that we've been working on. Um, our water chestnut program, we were lucky enough to hire six of uh, six college interns, and um, we'll have a program that, uh, you know, hand pulling, <coughs> concentrate on some of the, uh, the scattered, scattered plants in the river, some of the other water bodies throughout Oswego County, uh, Rice Creek, uh, you know, Nida, tributaries to Oneida Lake. Some of the other tributaries we're still working on. There are wetland permits involved, and we are still it really just workload. We have not gotten every permit that we need, so there are water bodies that will probably go untouched this year. But the primary one, uh, the river, will have that presence. <laughs> and you know, last year we pulled close to forty thousand pounds. Uh, we did. We do have a boat into the mix this year, and this year we'll have that right right out of the gate. So hopefully, we're we're pretty close <laughs> to that. Uh, you know, that level again this year. I think we have a great crew. And, um, you know, we have a little bit different strategy. Some of the, the treatments we've had in the past, uh, we noticed some of the edges, um, if the, the plants have a little bit of water covering, that, uh, you know, herbicide treatment is not quite as effective. So we may have a little bit more pull this year, especially with the bulk uh, in those high density areas. And then uh, that program runs, we actually start Monday, they have a week of training, and then that runs 
from about the 19th of June all the way till somewhere around the August, August 10th or 11th. And we, uh, we do have, we have the permit in right now for the water chestnut treatments. Uh, I think around 800 letters went out to notify the public, all the riparian landowners, and that permit process is pretty rigorous. And this year we did have um, a, a single business bring to our attention some of the uh, you know, irrigation restrictions. Um, I think there was some changes in our, our modeling, which what it, what it does is determines the notification distance or what's called the dilution distance for irrigation. You have to be under one, uh, one part per billion, and that's, you know, that's um, those restrictions that you have for this you know, irrigation for various businesses, or various you know, uh, uh, ag or other businesses, and those are set by the DC, or the, well, I'm sorry, the, the restrictions are set by the label. So we have to follow that label, which um, is you know, obviously part of the permit and, and part of the regulations. Um, so with that said, we did have to do some, some things to um, get that particular business out of the dilution zone. And so what we did is um, you know, reduce the acreage in certain places. So you will see you know, Fulton area downstream to Minetto, there you will see half of it. After our first treatment, you'll see half of it green, half of it brown. Um, hopefully that's, that's the goal. And then you get into the second week of August, we'll get that other half. Uh, we get into, you know, a little bit later August, which um, really at that point, you're really just trying to get rid of the, you know, the vegetation. Uh, the first two are set to, you know, interrupt that seed cycle. So that's the, that's the process. The more we can interrupt that in a consecutive amount of years, you know, maybe five or more years at, at this point, um, that's, that's when you see that reduction in density and then we're able to handle that. So it's you know, quite, it's a big issue, probably not quite enough money devoted to it, but we grab you know, certainly what we can for outside funding. And um, I think that the amount of you know, effort and resources we put towards it has kept it at bay, you know, kept it under control, I think without anything. I would see that that acreage probably triple inside of five years if we were not to do anything. I think the complaint calls obviously would uh, would also increase. Uh, with that said, the next set uh, invasive we've been working on this time of the year is the giant hogweed program. I think everyone's familiar with that. Just uh, real quick, this causes hyper uh, hypersensitivity to um, to the sunlight. Basically, if you get that sap on you, and we have around 60 sites in Oswego County. Um, you know, every year some are taken off and it's just a monitoring effort. Every year some are added, new calls come in. So we're, I think we, we certainly have had a lot of success. We're seeing that some of the sites we go to, it's no longer there, which is great. Um, you know, and unfortunately just going to base of work, it was moved by whatever, you know, birds, water, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, you know, unfortunately pops up in other areas, but we have that control effort underway and I think obviously continuing that is really important. We do use some outside, uh, some state funding for that and that should be underway here and if it's not, if it didn't start yesterday, it should start here in the next couple of days. Usually it's in May, but this year just contractor workload is a little bit, a little bit later. Um, we also, we've been working with, uh, oh, okay. Okay, on. This, this, those sites we have do you have a map that I, I do. The, the DEC kind of they keep it. If you if you get a hold of me, I can certainly uh, show you that, uh, or I you know I, I can certainly send it to you. They keep it relatively confidential because they're private landowner, uh, you know, private landowners, uh, where you know where the majority of these are. Some are more public. There are some uh, you know there, there's some on some of the national grid right away and things like that. But these are. They, you know, often let like the addresses, so they're always pretty careful about keeping those addresses close to um, close to that kind of thing. So, but I can certainly, you know, I can certainly talk to you more about that at a later time. Sure, um, but I can give you just really um, generically. I can say that I, I would say 99% of the sites are from Mexico over to the western border of our of our county, um, and there's some sites going into Cuba County that are quite quite large. So that you know having Seed source pretty close to make it you know make it kind of difficult. We have some involvement with DEC on you know on those sites at least with you know trying to pair them up with a contractor that'll maybe you know uh, take care of some of those sites. So. Um, Yo. <laughs> yeah. Does other counties work on this too? Uh, so the the state actually I would say that they they really control the program for hogweed. However, they do have areas where they don't have enough staff. They have what's called 
we have a, a couple different departments, uh, invasive species related. I think they have a strike team. They have, I don't know, some, some other folks that go out and actually treat it themselves. They have the pesticide applicators. Uh, but in our county, Jefferson County, and I would say like three or four others, they do rely on some local organization. And for us, that was that we were approached first, and that, that was us. Uh, so it's not every single county, but I would say that treatment does occur in every county, it's just not necessarily the local organization. Local Did district. you say Mexico West? You said for you because of. Um, I, I don't, I think, so the state treats the sites, um, there's one particular site we have where herbicide treatment's not allowed, and they have to do that by, we actually, um, in the past, we organized a, um, a person to mow it four times, uh, it does not stop it, I mean, what it does is it basically makes it bolt every time you mow it, but if you can mow it before that seed sets, you're at least Hopefully, controlling the spread. It's not obviously not the best scenario, but um, that's that's what you know. It's a relatively inexpensive treatment that do at least make some some level of effort. Absolutely. Um, so the next couple of invasives we you know we deal with. We get a lot of questions on the emerald ash or the hemlock borea delta. Um, and both of these are really more of an asset based treatments because of their spread and, and you know sort of out of control. So that Emerald Ash Borer, uh, we've actually partnered up with uh, what's called um, uh, Slilo. It's a uh, it's, um, St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario um, prism or a partnership for regional invasive species management. Big mouthful. But that's the, how the, that was the state's answer to setting up these regional invasive species management organizations. And we do, you know, partner with them on, on a few different things. So in this case, at Rice Creek, we actually, um, I believe that they, you know, we help with the application. They really, they, they get the insects, but we go with them to deliver these uh, wasps that are parasitizing the emerald ash borer. So after a while, we'll see if that did take. Um, so we go out and release them. It's not as fun as it sounds. It's really a tough to, you know, insects fly out, or you can get them to fly out. But, um, so. It's, but it, it should be effective. We are hoping, you know, obviously hoping that over time that will take and not necessarily solve the problem you see at hand right now. You'll see um, that blonde, uh, when you see a nice gray colored ash and you see this blonde color, that's the woodpecker is trying to get the larva. And that's all over the county, top to bottom, side to side. And that, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. So this asset base, I would say Rice Creek, it's public, it has recreational trails. And that they have stands of 90 to 100 percent ash trees that will be a huge problem so doing what we can there independence park we have the hemlock william delgid and the human services committee a few months ago did allow us to uh to release the the insects at, at a request from the uh, new york state hemlock initiative which is part of cornell university and we um we are planning on that there's a couple different biocontrol agents they have and hopefully those will be re reduced the idea is, is maybe in a decade you may be able to reduce that pesticide treatment that we have to do every year over there. Um, again, asset based, that would be a huge, an incredible um, inconvenience to have, you know, a thousand trees die off over there with being open to the public, huge liability risk. So we're hoping that we can curtail that. And, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, the, a few, some of the other things we've, we've been working on. Um, you know, Triple E, big deal obviously in this county at certain times of the year with mosquito populations and the, the very vast water resources that we do have here. Um, so we have obviously the health department gets into the spring and we uh, we actually did work with the health department a little bit. We have been over the past few years supplying these dump kits. They've become pretty popular larvicide kits that um, are, uh, you know, effective at container, you know, controlling larva in uh, containerized water. So we've worked with the health department a little bit. We're making them available there. They may at some point, if they um, you know, may perhaps have some funding in the future to help out a little bit, but at least uh, helping with some of the you know literature and education and outreach. So that's you can get those out to the towns too, don't you? Yeah, so they, they go out to all the towns, the villages, uh, anybody that, that calls, they're able to come to our office. There's a cooler out front. John, they can open that up and grab uh, what they need for that. So uh, that's been a neat, neat program. Um, let's see, we've also been, I've reported in the past, uh, we've gotten into these nine element watershed plans a bit. Uh, we have a little bit of involvement with the Oneida Lake one and some pretty heavy involvement with the Sandy Creeks watershed. Now, obviously, northern part of our county, 
Uh, so that one is, is quite involved. That involves our, you know, some of our staff partnering with, with Jefferson County Soil and Water District. Uh, we go out everywhere from our county up into Jefferson because it's the entire watershed. Doesn't necessarily know the county or, or legal uh, mm -hmm. or political boundaries. So that that extends up into that area. So we go right up through there. We sample uh, water twice. Uh, let me see, two days, um, twice a, a month. And we have 14 sample sites that it gets delivered to a lab in, um, in Syracuse or East Syracuse. And then those results over time will be put into a model and produce a report, uh, produce a plan, and it's supposed to have some some you know, potential corrections, some best management practices, and it should give a leg up for some funding in the future. Now, obviously, that capacity has to be there to implement those projects, but um, that's a, probably a few years out before those results, or a couple years out before the results are produced. Um, but that is, um, you know, it's a, it's a it's a great, you know, great start. That one obviously you have some some issue, you know, with Sandy Pond as far as uh, harmful algal bloom confirmed in the last few years. So that will will uh, give some some answers, and I think it's a good uh, mm -hmm. good thing for us to get into. And then several other, uh, well, I'll just uh, cut, you know cut this kind of short. Several other projects that were you know were involved in this year. Lots of planning, uh, everything from. Um, you know, some water quality projects, the forestry projects. We recently uh, wrote a letter of support and committed to some maybe technical assistance, education for um, a very large, um, like several million dollar grant with uh, Central New York uh, Regional, headed up by Central New York Regional Planning for urban forestry. It'll have mitigation for ash borer impacts. It'll have, um, you know, tree planting, tree inventory, things like that. So that's a really neat venture that uh, we certainly, you know, was a no-brainer to say yes to. And uh, for us, um, you know, technical assistance, I always mention this, but that really has shown zero signs of slowing down, if anything, it really has just picked up. Um, I believe in, in the forestry realm, there seems to have been a retirement here uh, that hasn't been the last few days, it's in the next next few weeks uh, with the DEC as far as private forestry technical assistance, and so ours has definitely seen an uptick. And, where um, we, right now we have about eight or even nine or plus for forest management plans. So probably a little more than we can, uh, than I can handle, I think, in this year. But we have, you know, that that is really steadily growing. Lots of, you know, what can I do with my properties, you know, things like that. And we're out there trying to answer those things. Thank you, Joe. As you could see, anybody questions for Joe? Yeah, Joe, does, does your office <coughs> reach out to um, these individuals that, um, are part of the new agricultural um, district plan, you know, made 30 this year. Um, Do you I don't think we, I don't think we make an effort to, to reach out to them directly, unless they're, unless you guys have communication with, with Eric on that. But I, I think that, I mean, they're more than welcome. I think the information is given to them, and there are efforts, uh, like our office partners. So they're made aware of your, of I, your I believe so, because there, there's efforts like the, uh, Ag Agency Awareness Day, the Cooperative Extension, our office, uh, NRCS, and, and FSA were involved in, and that's open up to, you know, open to the public. I think they had 30 or so or 40 participants in that, and, and those are the folks that are, you know, that are targeted, I guess, for those sorts of things. So they do know about the programs like agricultural environmental management, you know, ag values, things like that, and district, obviously. Okay. And um, Erica is on the board for Barton Land. She is. Yes. So she's she's right there. So she knows which ones are being added to it. Austin, I just wanted to add. I've had a couple opportunities in the recent past to work with Joe on a couple projects, economic development projects uh, near the county airport, and it's been very helpful. Uh, them as a resource and working with us to be able to put companies in touch with them and and have uh, some you know some environmental evaluations done on wetlands and things like that. So. Uh, I look forward to kind of continuing and kind of building that, but I, I know that's a, it's a good resource for us to have, too, to be able to put companies in touch with them instead of having to push them towards a consultant or something like that where they'd have to, you know, spend a significant amount of money and, and, and not get the same level of service. So it's a good relationship. Thank you. I know, and I think you've also had a reference for soil uh, solar farms that you've had some townships ask you about wetlands and everything for solar farms. So you kind of cover a big umbrella over uh, the whole county on several issues. Thank you, Joe. You do an awful lot of work with your the few people that you have <coughs> in your office. You cover a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Any that. other questions for Joe? Okay. Um, next up, promotion and tourism. 
We have distributed the uh, visitor guide throughout the county, uh, you know, hotels, um, town halls, uh, college was a big one because obviously the summer's come up with students are going to come up with their parents to see what they can do uh, throughout the county. So if there's anyone that feels that it hasn't been distributed in your area, feel free to reach out to us. We want to welcome distribute as far as, as much as we can to promote the county. Um, the racetrack, uh, we have partnered with them for advertising. We will be uh, sponsoring a race July 1st. Uh, the second turn is a very large and very nice uh, 10 by 12 uh, billboard, as well as their flow racing, which reach, reach between a uh, million to 1.2 million people around the world that do come here. We have two commercials, two 30 second commercials that uh, every race uh, is on. Uh, thought process is to people do come here for the race, but can they extend their stay, obviously, to get them to stay longer in the county? Or, oh, I didn't know I, there was a beach, or I didn't know I could go fishing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Oh, the Toledo County Fair is June 30th to July 2nd. We're partnering with them as well to help them advertise to get more people there. Um, obviously, it's big on agro-tourism. Um, so we do have a, a partnering with the uh, Froggy 101. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, out of Watertown to get those people to come into uh, that area those three days. Obviously, WRBO. WRBO. Um, hoping to help them out being that they moved from uh, August, um, from July to uh, the last week of June, usually later in July. They moved it this year. It's usually a four day, now it's a three day. So we're helping them out as best we can to make sure that, you know, it goes to that. Um, that's the question. Did they get right yet? Say, they did. They, they, oh, they got an article this morning, and I, I wasn't uh, just going back to vacation on Friday and Monday, so Kelly was on a call yesterday. Um, I saw something this morning that they did get rides as well as did they do surface as well? They yep, yeah, they have that they call it surface alive, but it's actually a, what they're calling an aerial show because there aren't any animals. Um, so they will have that. They did that because they couldn't get rides, but then they also got rides. Ontario Amusements is going to be coming up for three days. Perfect. That'll help a lot because that was definitely not to get rides. Um, when you said the college. Do you give stuff to the college so that they can send it out to people that are coming to the, as you say, to get to the parents? You know, you get these new freshmen coming at admission. Is it part of their bags, admission package? You know, bags, you know, the tout, small things in there. All, you know, sort of guide, the visitor guide, trail maps, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, the last thing is the website with Zimmerman. We've had three meetings so far. There's supposed to be half-hour updates once a week on Wednesdays. We've averaged about two and a half hours every Wednesday, <laughs> uh, trying to, you know, figure out all of our, our details that we can obviously get out there to people. Um, they're very good. They, you know, obviously take a lot of notes. They listen to us. Um, right now, it's more of what we're doing is like a skeleton. So, like, what you see on the website, what you can click on. So we're, we're putting everything into categories of where we want them to inform people when they come here. Is, you know, restaurants, hotels, um, trying to see where uh, underground railroad, where to fit that, um, fishing, hunting, et cetera, et cetera. So it's uh, it's very kind of cool to build a website, you know, from ground up. Obviously, we discussed before that 2010 was our last time that we redid our website. So now to, you know, get into the future, is, is, it's a very cool thing to work with them. Will we have it before the end of 23 or now? I believe we will. Yeah, so, like I said, it's a six month process and we just started in the middle of May. So I think we can get there, yeah. We have to make sure you have room for the green. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Phil. Hi. Um, I just have two tourism related updates. <clears throat> First is on the rain sanctuary. I was notified last week that, we, that NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is finishing its work on the project and forwarding it through final review and approval to the other federal agencies in July. That's a process that could take a couple of months, so we're still probably looking at uh, designation early in 24. Uh, but they did indicate to me that they are done except for one thing, coming up with a name. And tonight, if you want to uh, view it, 
there is a special meeting of the Sanctuary Advisory Council online. I think there's a link in the press release on our, on our website where you can join it. And they'll be discussing that one topic, what should the name of this sanctuary be. We, it's important to us because it's going to determine, it, it, it determines the marketability and how we can market this. Uh, it was proposed as Great Lake Ontario National Marine Sanctuary. Um, the two names that have risen to the top are Lake Ontario National Marine Sanctuary or Shining Waters National Marine Sanctuary. And that phrase is the meaning of the word Ontario. Um, both have advantages. Lake Ontario puts it on the map, but how marketable is it? Uh, Shining Waters is a much more attractive name. It's attractive to more than just shipwreck enthusiasts. It carries the heritage of the native language all the way up through modern day with the sunsets. It's a more inclusive name. It might be a more marketable name. Its drawback is it doesn't include the location. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to have this whole discussion tonight online if you're interested. Um, the naming is uh, Noah wants local input into the name. It's ultimately their decision. Uh, but they are looking at uh, those are the two that have risen to the top until somebody else comes up with something better. And we're also discussing do we address the deficiencies of either name by adding a marketing tagline to it. So that's going on uh, tonight. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask about if they thought about like Eastern Shores or something because that's I mean that's more of like a sub geography but I mean that kind of tells you this is a, a marine sanctuary specific to the Eastern Shores of Lake Ontario. I mean I don't know if it is including we Western. With, with um, Eastern Lake Ontario, mm -hmm. the National Marine Sanctuary, you, 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 once you get beyond three words or yeah. know, three words it becomes like um, so it'll be interesting to, you know, and then there have been names suggested that have oddly nothing to do with what we're trying to do. But, so unfortunately, <laughs> they're, they're, they're uh, abandoning those. But they're at, a, at the tourism conference that was held uh, here a few weeks ago, the State Tourism Conference, they, they did a quick uh, survey of all the people who marketed. You know, those are all marketers. They're from all over New York State. And they read off four possible names, and the two that got equal and the loudest applause were Lake Ontario and Shining Waters. So, what about the Phil Church Marines? <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, the second thing is the county, uh, the Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council, and the City of Oswego are working together to uh, have an event on June 24th uh, in Brightbeck Park to. Uh, commemorate uh, uh, the crew of a World War II B-24 bomber that disappeared in Lake Ontario in 1944, last heard over the city of Oswego in the middle of the night. Um, this is being done uh, because a book was just published on that event, not only on the disappearance, but also on who the crew were and all the people who have been searching for it in the last 70 years. Still missing, nothing was ever the bodies, the plane itself, nothing ever washed up except the wing. So, uh, except the wing. Except the wing. And uh, this author located in his research descendants of the crew, and they will be coming to a studio for this event on June 24th. So, it's going to be kind of special. I just wanted to let you know where the county, city, and the Marine Sanctuary are co-sponsors of that. Uh, be the morning of uh, June 24th at Great Park. Any other questions for Bill about that, or Dan about the promotion tourism? Tentatively, 10 o'clock. We're trying to instill a phone call that was out. There is. The other reason we picked that is the last remaining B-24 in the world is going to be in Syracuse that weekend. So we're trying to figure something out for that. Okay, cool. Totally cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Dan.
of Planning Community Development Department update, Mr. Tim. All right, Matt, I'll put one last little tourism plug in there too. This Memorial Day weekend, we had our uh, first tournament at the Legends Field. Uh, there were 50 teams that played, and almost 2,000 people over the weekend were there. Uh, they completely booked up all the hotels in Oswego County, on, and then overflowed into Watertown and uh, Route 31. So um, again, a great event. A lot of people, obviously, in our restaurants, in our hotels, buying gas and groceries and things like that for a three-day tour. So um, just want to put a little plug in for that. Um, I want to make a couple mentions. Um, the, we are in the process of putting back together the county planning board. Um, anyone who uh, has some thoughts on uh, either planning board members from your communities uh, that you think would make some sense, uh, you could shoot me names, and I'm still in the process of putting that together. Uh, that is a formal board that this legislature does appoint, but I'll be bringing forward the recommendation uh, through this committee. How many member boards? Well, that is a good question. It is up to us to decide that. It has had a different number of members over the years. And so a um, conversation really has to do with what we want to do with it. In the past, it's had certain responsibilities, um, including some of the uh, reviews from the towns and villages. Um, that process was very slow when the board had to review it. Um, currently now, we go through our planning office. The encounter village is required by state law to get a second opinion or a first opinion from the county. Uh, that process currently goes through our planning office and then is, um, is, is then sent out, decision sent out to the encounter village, usually within less than a week turnaround. It's a very quick turnaround. Back when th that board had to review it, they couldn't review it until the monthly meetings had to be released. And so it slowed down our towns and villages. My expectation would be now that this board is coming back, we would not look to add that back in again. I think that uh, most of our towns and villages are expecting a pretty quick turnaround. It holds them up to do their projects. It seems to be working well. Personally, I don't think we need to add that extra step in there. Uh, but this board does have other responsibilities, uh, including uh, recommending a position on the Port Authority Board. So that would be one I think we are discussing. Uh, but we want to take a bigger picture of the conversation that I've had uh, with everything going on with Mike Brown, but overall land use, overall highest and best use of the area of the properties we have in this county. Uh, we talked a little bit about when properties come up for auction, what is the highest and best use for them? Um, we may be partnering with the land bank, we're partnering with some of our planning boards throughout the community. So those are all conversations we're having. If you have thoughts or any other thing else you'd like to see be put in the responsibilities of this board or you know, what this board would look to do. Um, it has been called together a number of times over the last 20 years, uh, but then quickly abandoned, I'll be honest. Looking over the history of it, it usually doesn't last very long. People don't really stay on it, and it doesn't continue to meet has historically been called together to appoint members to the court board and pretty much made an after that. So the question is, it is the only way we can make that appointment and there uh, looks to be potentially a, a position that would need to be appointed to the court board um, and that could be the number one priority, but I would hate to go through all the work of reappointing this board only to just abandon it in the next month. So we'd like to find a good use for it, but again, we're not trying to meet every month if we have nothing, no reason to. So potentially we look at a quarterly meeting schedule, but really we need to find a way that this group would then uh, offer the best use to the rest of the, the county. I mean, Boston, did you have a question? Uh, uh, just in terms of, are you looking for people that are from like elected officials or is it non-elected or is it some mix or what, what, I guess just to have some light bulbs go off for some of the people in the room to make some suggestions, what type sure. of people are you looking for? It, it historically has been a mix of those things. Uh, it has been planning board members from throughout the community. Um, you want to have a good mix because you're going to have some folks if, if you're serving on this planning board for the county, but it's your home community that's putting forward the recommendation. You know, obviously, you need to have a number of other people who do show up. Uh, I guess historically, they had some issue with getting enough people to attend these meetings, um, and so that was part of the issue as well, which is why they, they shrunk the board um, from, I think, it was 25 or something down to 15. Uh, but again, those are conversations. We want to make sure that the whole community is involved, you know, that, you know all the way from the north to the south of both towns. Um, with Micron going on, I was going to mention that we do have, um, as a quick Micron update, um, there is a Micron Leadership Committee meeting coming up this week. Um, there, you probably have all heard, but there are a number of Micron subcommittees that have kind of fallen out of that, including um, a Infrastructure Committee, a Tourism Committee, an Economic Development Committee, a Housing Committee. Um, and you're getting a lot of folks from all across our county that are coming and attending these meetings. Really great conversation. The infrastructure meeting, I joked that we had about a little less than a month ago, it was one of the best meetings that I've ever been a part of. It was you know, key uh, stakeholders from all of our communities getting together. These are you know, people who work in these wastewater treatment plants you know, in Hastings or in, in, uh, in Phoenix area, right? Um, coming together to kind of put together a plan that makes sense so they're not in silos, that they're working together to best use the funds available. Um, they put together a plan that 
you know, it doesn't work just for me, but it works for the entire county. So um, those are happening. What I don't want to do with this county planning board is be totally redundant, making a group that you know has to meet again to do what we're already doing through the bike ground infrastructure committee meeting. So we're really putting that together. I'd be happy to um, take any input or insight from anyone uh, around the board. Mark, I'd like to see a mission statement for this uh, committee. So that they know exactly what it is that it's doing. Sure. Right? Kind of all over the place, specifically what this is going to do that it's not already being done in some other committee. Right. So we can put that together. So can then bring it out to the community and say, hey, look, this is our goal. This is what we're trying to do. And this is something that was created by the legislature, I think, in shoot, maybe 50 years ago. So it has a, a kind of a, a purpose. It has an assigned purpose based on that. But, but like you said, they've only met to a point. Exactly. It's got a high failure rate to this point. Almost 100%. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we shouldn't even have it. Well, I guess that's why I'm asking. I think, I think we have to, like, we have to have it if we want a representative on the board. So there's a requirement that we have to come out of the planning board. So there's something, that, something more that we can add to it other than appointing someone to the board that would be fruitful or beneficial to this legislature. Does that count? Right. Um, so you forgot there's a transportation committee too. Yes. Um, just a thought, you could um, actually, Corey, uh, send a letter to or email to all the local town clerks to uh, to query their local planning boards for members. The easy way to recruit. So I hope to have um, some recommendations for the next next month's meeting. Um, how many going for you? What's that? Have them involved with completing townships. Comprehensive plan. So. It's a great lead in. It's also like I, you knew what I was going to say next. So that's a great idea. And <laughs> where we're headed with that, as we've all talked about, and actually hope, hope to have a resolution next month for everyone, um, is that as we've all heard, and uh, maybe at the phrase plan or be planned has been banded about, and there's a good reason for it. Uh, many of our communities have indicated that they are interested in participating in a, in a, in a uh, more in depth strategic planning process. Um, and so this, uh, my understanding is that this legislature is interested in helping to partner with those communities who would like to do that. And so uh, I'm hopefully going to have a plan for as a resolution for next month that would include setting aside some internal ARPA money uh, that could be then utilized in partnership with our town villages uh, to help them create a new or update their old strategic plan or potentially even help to fund projects that were specifically outlined in their plan. Um, Many don't know this, and I didn't either. Uh, we, the county, has not updated our actual strategic plan formally in almost 20 years. So that's something that we also really need to do. I mean, it's hard for us to go out there and tell the town villages that they need to update their plans or get a plan if, if ours is a bit outdated. So we are also going to have some funds um, requested to be set aside to update ours formally as well. Um, one of the great things about doing them all together is that we can kind of hopefully save some money by working out the process to include multiple town villages with ours. Uh, it'll save them money, it'll save us money, and then we'll partner with that in, in, in true form. That'll save some money to the taxpayers as well. I think it'll be a good use of the ARPA funds. So, um, Ben? Can I ask you a question? What would the cost to the ARPA funds be? Do you know roughly? Um, well, it depends on how many towns and villages are interested. And that's part of the conversation. We had to put this together actually for this month, but we didn't have a plan on how many towns and villages really wanted it. So <laughs> it was just the idea we've got essentially. 33 of them out there. We'd love if they all want to participate, but some of them have been ahead of the game. and They've put their own money into it, and they've got their own plan started or finished. Uh, so the thought would be we want a better understanding of what exactly we're asking for. My hope would be for next month meeting to know there are 11 towns and villages who are participating. On average, it's forty dollars to $50,000 if they were to bid out separately. We hope to save some money by bidding all together, um, and potentially they want to participate maybe 50-50 with the county, or maybe 70-30, right? We have to put together a plan that works. Uh, I would expect it to be somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand. We just never used even goals two thousand. We never used it. That was a huge effort. I'd rather put it in sewer system. Well, that's part. That's of the part plan. of the company. That is part of the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, so we're looking at we have to study the structure now. What we've got, you know, I mean, wouldn't it be better to just have an engineer look at what we've got in the county? And say this is what it'll cost. It's so that, 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 rather than let the towns try to figure out many uh, grant sources for water and sewer type infrastructure want to see that it what you're proposing is part of their comprehensive plan. 
So it's, it, it, it scores you higher in your points and more likely to get It's true. It's, it's really a two-pronged attack is to have the plan, but then have the in-depth analysis. So this is the plan side of it. This this uh, this group in the legislature as a whole approved uh, a CNS study last month that is doing the other problem which you're mentioning right now. It's going in and going in, knocking on the doors of every wastewater treatment plant we have in this county, you know, getting in there and, and truly marking, you have this, you have this, the discussion we've always had about the netto. They're right there being underutilized. This we're gonna have someone in that room walking through the, the, the basement, looking at things, measuring and getting a true understanding of just how much utilization you have is available. Huge capacity. Absolutely. And this is gonna so that CNS study is gonna give us a, a true understanding of exactly what that looks like. Austin. Uh, the other thing is, and, and Tim had kind of mentioned this, in doing the comprehensive plans with the localities, we're also going out and it's one thing to say you have capacity or you don't have capacity. It's another, what do you want? Like, what do you want as a community? Because we aren't going to sit here and say we're going to put money into your wastewater treatment plant if you don't want to grow. Like, what What are we, you know, why would you do that? So part of it is which communities are on board and actually want to grow and, and are interested to be partners and do that. And I'm looking at the, with the economic development hat on where, you know, it's a little different. but. You know, I, I think that that's important to understand. If, like, you know, if Minato has a big capacity, but they're like, we're good with what we are, then you know, you're not going to look at that. If, if you're looking at Phoenix or, or Central Square or another place that's saying we are prime for development, we want it, we're willing to do what we have to do, then that's where you're going to want to put your resources and, and, and have that kind of conversation. Well, I I understand that, but let's just say without Minato right now, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have any of your Seneca Manor, you wouldn't mm -hmm. have any of those office buildings senior housing, I mean, that's huge over there. Sure. They also have a senior housing facility directly behind the wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. It would give you the opportunity to completely encompass that whole west side sure. and, and tie it into a sewer. I mean, everybody knows there's massive affluent discharge in these ditches. I read the Cornell study. It's a significant issue sitting on the edge of the Great Lake. We used to pull all our water out of the ground from wells and run it through a septic system. We're now taking it through city water, a straw out of the lake, we're super saturating the ground, and there's a ton of fluid discharge with facts the quality of that precious lake. So I think every one of the facilities is critical, not just for development, but for the health, welfare, and well-being of the entire community. Larry, what, one of the other things, conversations that we had in discussions is maybe tying some of these waste treatment facilities together. Absolutely. Right? So if we can link them, I've got Minetto working at like 20% capacity, if we can tie it in where maybe, I don't know, Oswego or fall or overflowing with capacity, we can kind of spread it out that way. I don't way. think anybody's got too much capacity right now. There, there are facilities that Phoenix particularly has. has well, we're problem. way over. Yeah. Yeah, we so, don't have any capacity. Yeah. <clears throat> So you need to expand. Yeah, well, that's that's that. been one of the big topics of the conversation. Yeah, big Saturday. project. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the last thing I want to mention was, and I won't steal lost the thunder on this, but this is CFA, the consolidated funding application period is open, uh, closing tail end or mid uh, July. Uh, there's a number of opportunities. It, just as a quick uh, summary, CFA process is the way that the state of New York has set up to get their grant monies out there to the communities who are interested or private projects that are interested in, in partnering with the state. Uh, so it's a web-based portal. Uh, you, you jump in, you put your information and what you want to do, and it will kind of steer you to what funding agencies exist and to what you know where you could best get your uh, project funded. Um, so we've done that as a as a county now a number of years. Uh, my understanding is we're hoping to do something similar. And so for next year or next month's resolution, if there are some uh, CFA applications that we'd like to put in, either um, internally with our internal staff or with our partnership with Strategic, which is our grant writing firm that we hire. Um, that we would then uh, come to you next month for a uh, resolution authorizing us to apply. And so we hope to see that for next month as well, assuming there are some. You know, there are a couple projects that we're looking at that could potentially be funded, uh, but as has been noted, we don't want to just run out there getting grant app applications if we can't administer what we currently have. So we, we need to kind of understand where we stand overall as well. Uh, but I would encourage you, uh, there is a, my understanding, a new Restore New York round, as you probably saw, we uh, were awarded a number of Restore projects in our county over the last two rounds. Um, and something where I think you have any underutilized older buildings um, that could potentially uh, apply. Um, they have indicated that the state is looking for smaller projects, not really these big ones that we've heard. Probably the result of the Axel Hell Award uh, with a pretty substantial amount. Bolton's been receiving the recipient of a larger one. If you've got some smaller projects, two, three hundred thousand dollar projects, four hundred thousand dollar projects, 
they are looking to fund smaller projects. So kind of keep that in mind throughout your communities. Uh, there might be a cool historical building that could be utilized that hasn't been, and this is a great opportunity. For Storm York is one of the only funds that I've seen where they will fund 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of your projects. Uh, most of them through our state development specifically is only 20 percent of your project. So now is this all for public? What about private property? Well, Restore New York is, is it does need to be partnered with a community with a, one of the uh, municipalities. So let's pretend you know Bex went through I believe Village of Mexico. Or, um, you know these other ones have gone through the city of Oswego, so the city of Fulton. So we as a county or with the towns or villages we kind of have to yeah. put the application in, but it'd be a partnership with that project. Because okay. I know in the town of Scribble, we have some absolutely beautiful historic homes that they can't afford to do it because they're historical. Well, they would have to be for a project. It wouldn't just be for someone to get money to fix up their home. It would have to be for like an economic development project. Um, Tim is Tim is right. Um, the you need to have a project, uh, a community sponsor, municipal sponsor, which would then take the funding, and then it flows from that municipal sponsor to a private developer. So Bex Hotel, that's owned by Crystal Waters and and her daughter, and that funding will ultimately go to them, but it has to flow through the Village of Mexico to get there. And the same thing in, in the City of Fulton with it's going to go to Oswego Health, but it has to flow through the City of Fulton to go there. So. Uh, but but yeah, and as Tim said, I mean they're looking for smaller projects, or I don't know, hypothetically a former closed elementary school somewhere might be you know a good project, uh, you know, or um, you know, and, and I know there's a lot of communities that are looking and saying, hey, they want to try to you know get some senior housing or other things like that. Those are the perfect kinds of projects for this this program, you know, taking a vacant, underutilized building and turning it into something productive. That's what they're looking to do. And then we have uh, a couple of just, I, I wanted to make note uh, that Sherwin had mentioned that there are a number of grants that we actively are working through. You probably remember there's the CDBG funding that did the uh, the housing work that we've done uh, for the, there was the migrant uh, workers program that we did. Um, we've also been able to replace some HVAC systems in some low income housing sections around the county, uh, specifically in partnership with some of our community members. So again, they are actively being managed. We expect to close both of those CDBG projects mm -hmm. this year. Um, and just to touch on two other ones, actively we're working on the Brownfield Grant Program. If you have community, your old gas stations and things like that in your community that you would like to get some environmental review of free of charge, get, uh, give me the information or get uh, Karen in our office to get, get that information. We're still adding, they will get a phase one and phase two potentially on uh, inspection and no charge them. That could be you know $10,000 of savings to that developer. So it's a really great opportunity. Um, I do know we are still looking to add to that list. There's still funds available. Um, and that's important because traditionally our brownfield monies have only gone to the two cities in the certified brownfield areas. It's a cool opportunity here for some of our towns and villages to benefit from it. The last one I'll hit is our kayak launch project, which uh, many of you had asked me where that stands. Uh, we do have the funding. We have two grants that will fund almost 80% of the project. Uh, we put everything on hold due to the rising costs through COVID over the last two years. Uh, we have bid that project out. It does look that the uh, result will do it, and we hope to have it finished by the end of this year. We're still working on what that price will look like. There could be potentially a little bit more of a share on that, which we talked about in the media, but I think we have the, the funds in the grant to cover. If anybody has any questions, you can Thank you. Uh, and then, I don't know if transportation, I don't think that's a bullet point, but I know Heather was hoping to. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. So Tim's going to hand out some, uh, I need you guys like cousins, so I like you guys some I did want to address, if anyone is interested in joining them, uh, joining, in a, joining a Micron subcommittee, I have the link to where you guys can see all the subcommittees and the summary of what each subcommittee does, so just let me know and I can send that over to you. Um, I'm going to do more of a high-level update to keep it really short and simple to bullet points because I like to talk a lot. Um, so if you want a more in-depth version of what I've been doing this past month, there is a very short one-page report in some of those packets uh, that we have done the last month. Um, so like we do that. Um, farmers market transportation. So I've been working very closely with many different organizations and public transit to get farmers market routes back up and running this year. Um, so we're in the final stages of 
creating the draft route and doing dry runs, and then we're going to go with marking the materials ready for the farmers market routes. Um, just to keep it simple for you guys, these routes are improved from last year. We have more stops along the way. Seniors don't stay on the bus longer than 15 minutes. The buses come by the markets every 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and uh, locations in Fulton are now able to go to the Oswego Market and vice versa, and so we have more access to be able to go to, to each one of the markets. And so I'll keep you updated on Farmer's Market. Um, how many of you guys have seen this access brochure? I want to address this because this is going to help with employment as well, and that's, that's super important to me. But access is a new program. It's a pilot program for the next 12 months. You guys may have heard of call in my previous mm -hmm. uh, This partnered with Curve to Curve is essentially replacing the call in my system. So this gives people more access, more days of the week, and the hours are also extended. So you'll see here that this is kind of a little cheat sheet that OCO created. So let's you know when the service is just 60 and older, and when the service is open to all ages. This service is more affordable. It used to be six to eight dollars per lay of the trip, and now now it's three to four dollars just depending on your age group. Um, it also is available in more areas of the county, like the last guy, this was only available twice a month. It's now available two times a week for curb to curb and three times a week for access. Um, so this is greatly expanding service. Seniors have the opportunity to have transportation uh, that's on demand where the bus comes directly to their home five days a week now. Um, so if you guys want more information on this, come talk to me. I have plenty of these brochures and flyers that I can distribute. Uh, but that is another resource that's going to help with employment. Um, annual transportation resource document. So Boyd had a wonderful idea. He's been pushing for this for a long time. So I took the idea and I ran with it. But we're going to have an annual transportation resource document that we update every single year that's going to list every single transportation program, provider, and option for people based on this is a donation-based service or this is a fee-for-service. This is a public transit route. Um, so there's a rough draft of that inside of your guys' packets. It's not a public friendly version. We're working on a version that will be easier on the eyes for the public. But the information is there so you guys can see what current resources that we have available. Um, URL, so we don't really have a whole lot of information about transportation on our county website. So I'm working with David Owens on revamping our URL so that when people Google or go to our website, they're going to have links that will take them to the websites where they need to purchase public transit passes or get information on the resources that are available. This will be a, a singular uh, website where we can have a we call those, uh, Q, uh, QR code um, on the marketing materials that will take people to this website. Um, rebranding. So right now we're doing some work into rebranding, which is very important, um, starting with technology. So one thing that our county doesn't have is any technology on our buses. Um, it makes it difficult during the audit process. It makes it difficult for improving public transit routes because right now it's all kind of paper. The driver sits there, it slows the route down to check how many riders are on there, at which location. And when you need to make updates, you have stacks and stacks and stacks of papers that you have to go through to figure out how many hires are there. Nothing is digitized. Um, so TripSpark is a company that purchased Uber Route Match, which is who we were using before, to give us a quote for new tablets, which our tablets are 12 years old, but our drivers are not being used right now. Um, this technology has uh, capabilities of showing people in live action where the bus is, why they're waiting at the bus stop. So things like that, so people know, hey, like an Uber, my bus is going to be here in five minutes. So I know that, you know, I can see it moving along the trail. This technology is going to give us a lot of access to uh, see the data virtually so that we can make improvements to the public transit route in an easier fashion. Um, it does a lot of routing, where you can punch in addresses that will tell you the best way to route. Right now, everything is all by hand. Google Maps, it's all looking at route maps, and so it's not the most accurate system. Uh, for reporting. So that's the start on the technology portion for rebranding. Um, a coordinated plan. So I've been working with Luke. Our transportation coordinated plan is outdated. And so Luke uh, put together a new census data for me to add into that plan. And we will have the plan updated by August because that's my deadline. Um, so we will have a new transportation uh, coordinated plan, new milestones, new goals, and updated data by August. Um, 
I did want to mention that those buses that are coming from the ETC funds that we did talk about earlier are replacement buses. These are not new buses that are going to be additional to the route. These are replacement buses to replace the current buses that we have um, because they are pushing 300,000 miles or losing engines and things like that. So those buses are going to replace those buses and they will have the capability to accept the technology that we want to put on the buses. So that's important for us. Um, we do have uh, lots of programs uh, that are going to help with employment. I, I really want to talk about first mile, last mile. Um, I really think that that would be a great program to bring to our county. We need to find a provider that's interested in doing that. But that's a program where a mode of transportation will pick somebody up from their home and take them to the nearest viable bus stop that will get them to employment resources. And it's not a literal mile. In other counties, sometimes they transfer people 30 miles to the correct bus stop. Uh, and that's going to help open up a lot more access if we can bring a program like that to our county. Um, and then the last thing, um, you know, we do have other programs like Rice Recovery, which will help people in substance use and mental health recovery get to employment. That is through Volunteer Transportation Center. That's available from 5 a.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning. And so right now that program is filling a gap where public transit is not available. That program can transfer people to and from employment 11 p.m., 12 p.m., 1 a.m. in the morning and back home. And that's a gap that we have right now is, is, it, is transportation that makes this um, And then the last thing, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the Motor Inn uh, purchased the La Siesta Motel. Um, so if you guys are familiar with the La Siesta Motel, it closed down. Uh, and it's been kind of a vacant lot. Uh, but now it's going to be used as an emergency housing facility. It's right along one of our public transit routes. And so we'll be able to add that right back into the public transit route to be able to pick people up from that emergency housing facility uh, at Los Angeles Hotel. Um, so that's all I have for you. If you have questions, you just let me know. Joel? Where is that located? Maple Maple Yes. Maple View. Yes. yes. Running all over. Running all over. Any other questions for Heather? You did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I mean, just have a look at that. And um, it's something that we, this is not information that we've had before. Yeah, this committee. And uh, thank you, Heather. This is awesome. Can start. Okay. Thank you, Heather. As always, you did a fantastic job. Um, Operation Suite of County, Austin. Okay, well that's a, uh, a hard presentation to follow uh, <laughs> with everything you brought on that. But uh, um, uh, to, uh, I know Tim had hinted at it, but the, um, so we are co-hosting a consolidated funding application workshop tomorrow afternoon at the Lake Ontario Event Conference Center from 3 to 5. Um, Operation Oswego County, the Oswego County Workforce Development Board and Greater Oswego Fulton Chamber of Commerce. We all came together to do that because we have a, just a bigger, we can promote it better as, as a group. In the past, this was something that was just an Operation Oswego County event, um, but I felt it was important to bring our other partners in and make sure that they're letting their constituents know so that we can make sure the most amount of people know about the resources that are out there. So. Um, if anyone, and I sent it out in an email to all legislators last Friday, it's been out through press releases and everything else, so hopefully you know about it. Um, if you're interested in going, please uh, RSVP by the end of today, just so we know how many seats to have. Um, I know that our attendance jumped from last week to what it is right now, so we just want to make sure that we don't have to have people standing for an hour and a half in the back of the room. So if you are interested or know other people, make sure they can RSVP. Um, and and that's, that's a great thing because there's about uh, Dan Kolinsky from Empire State Development is going to come and do that presentation, and it's related to the $225 million that Empire State Development gives out um, to, uh, across New York State. But they're also he's also going to be able to answer questions about the other programs that are in there, like there's DEC programs and other, other state programs that are part of the consolidated funding application. So if there's questions about it, that's your time to, to ask. And if you can't come, there's also, this, this one will not be recorded, but there will be other recorded sessions that will be put up on the the um, Central New York Regional Economic Development Council website, so you can either set, look at those yourself or send them to your constituents if they don't know what the programs are and want to have more information about it. So this is basically a uh, workshop for those interested Absolutely. in applying. If you're interested you in applying, you, you can ask the expert on the program, you know, what, what works, what doesn't, what should I, you know, what is eligible, what's not, what should I apply for, um, you know, this is my project, you know, where should I look? Um, I mean, we can help as well, but you're, you're getting a chance to talk directly to the uh, deputy director at the uh, Syracuse region for Empire State Development. They know the programs better than anybody, so that's your that's your chance. <laughs> um, 
Uh, another thing I wanted to uh, give an update on, um, and this is something that also legislators should be aware of, is that Operation Israel County is having their annual meeting next Thursday, uh, June 15th from 8 to 10 a.m. Um, it's an opportunity to get a free breakfast and a show. Um, we'll be doing the economic development highlights from the past year, as well as giving out five economic development awards for entrepreneurship and merit award and business of the year and, and jobs award and all those kinds of fun things. So. Um, I know that I don't think there's a lot of legislators so far that have RSVP for it. So if it's something you are planning to attend or interested, please get that in. So another thing we can make sure that we have the right amount of, of uh, settings down for, for breakfast to that. And like I said, that's next uh, Thursday, June fifteenth, eight to ten a.m. Um, it's right at the yep. yep, it's at the conference center as well. Sorry, both events are at the conference center. We you know don't have a lot of places that can host an event that size, so that, we use that for that. Um, other things that are going on, this is skipping around a little bit, so this is related to Micron and the Micron uh, Subcommittee for Economic Development. Um, this month we are going to be meeting with local communities and we're doing it in clusters, like we're going to be meeting with the Village of Central Square and Hastings together, we're meeting with the Village of Phoenix and Thomas Grupo together, kind of forcing these communities to kind of have a meeting together and talk about, hey, you have, a re you have an asset which will help this community, you have this which will help this you know, you have land, this community doesn't have a lot of land, so how can we partner and do things together to get the most impact and benefit out of the Micron opportunity in front of us. So we're doing that this month. Um, did you say so June 8th, which is this Thursday, the Micron Steering Committee is going to be meeting. Um, so we'll be, uh, per, uh, Tim and I will be participating in that as well. I think there might be a couple more people around the room here that will be. Um, another thing going on, so the Village of Phoenix, New York Forward, the um, we had our first public meeting that happened last week, and then we had a couple core team meetings that also happened in May. Um, there will be some more information coming out soon. They're going to be doing a call for projects. So when they originally did their proposal, they had to have a, a slate of projects that were part of that. doesn't mean that those are the only projects that potentially could get funding through the New York Forward. So they're going to be doing a call for projects, which is probably going to be going out either later this week or next week, and going through the middle of July. So if there's any new ideas or things that have come about, has to be within the boundary of the of the Village of Phoenix's New York forward boundary, but you know a lot can change in a year year's time in terms of what can happen. Actually, I believe that when they originally submitted this, we didn't know about Micron yet. So there, obviously, there can be a lot of new things that could happen within the village, um, you know that that would not have been possible or feasible beforehand. So so that's that's going to be going out, and once that call for projects goes out, I'll make sure you guys are all aware so you can let your constituents know that that that. If they're interested in doing a project or, or want to know more about what is going on, they can get involved. Um, and then just another thing, I, and, and uh, Tim had said this, so uh, we did recently find out, and these were two projects that we had both assisted, um, provided technical assistance and support, um, was that the Bex Hotel project in the Village of Mexico received uh, $1.82 million in Restore New York funding, and then Oswego Health for a project in the city of Fulton received $2 million. So it was very, um, it was very good. I, uh, I'll be candid, we didn't expect to get that much funding for the projects. Um, seeing what they funded projects in round one that were um, you know, more expensive projects, but I think that the way it worked out was that the majority of projects all, all submitted in round one and it didn't leave a lot of competition in round two. So it's it good for us though, because we got some good projects funded and, and I think it's the funding that they need to, to do those projects to the full, um, full capacity they need to. So, so we were happy to support those projects and happy to see them get funding through those sources. Any questions? What's the what's the dates like Hastings Village Central Square? Do you have dates? Um, working with Dave Turner on that, we are looking at the week of the nineteenth to the twenty third or twenty fourth. We don't have the exact date. Um, waiting to to see on that. It's probably going to be like an early afternoon or later afternoon meeting on one of the days in that week there. But we're we're working together to try to coordinate that. You're talking June, right? Yes, in June. Yeah, it's going to happen in June. So yep. you're going to send out information on that? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, but it's it's really important, and that gets back to you know what we were talking about earlier is that community. It's a two way street. Like we want to we want to bring things to Oswego County, but these communities need to want to have it. If if we're if we're going to be trying to push something in a community that doesn't want it, we want to know now so that we aren't wasting our time trying to you know bring uh, you know large industrial development and commercial development to communities that don't want it, and, and then creating a friction there. Do you do you have a place that you're going to hold that at? Not yet. Um, I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, I haven't figured it out yet. Do you have any su suggestions on a meeting and and you know on, on one of those? But depends on how many people you have. I mean, yeah. You do it as the town hall. Village offices aren't really that big. Yeah. But you okay. need to draw them in. Hastings, 
it all depends if they don't have anything going on. Sure. Yeah. Okay. You can follow up on that. Any other questions for Austin? Busy again. Thank you, Always Austin. Busy. Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, Paul. Good morning. Cornell Cooperative Extension. As best as last. Is that what you want me to say? Right. Yeah. Always yeah. agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, first of all, my apologies for being a little late. I was at the uh, meeting of the uh, Literacy Coalition of Oswego County, which we are a part of. Uh, it was a project of a county administrator, and I applaud him. Him and I were both in on the ground floor. And somewhere along the line, he managed to slip off, and I am still there. So uh, I need to talk to him to find out how he did that. Um, so the big thing uh, to talk about this morning is the Oswego County Ag Agricultural District Renewal. So the Ag District, for those people who are unaware of it, the Ag District is a designation that we receive from New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Um, in a nutshell, uh, belonging to the Ag District allows agricultural entities to avoid nuisance problems. So. It is not to be confused with the Ag Assessment Program. Um, that is a reduction in your taxes. Um, many, many years ago, Oswego County Soil and Water and Cooperative Extension of Oswego County got together and decided to split up who was going to be responsible for Joe. Joe takes care of the Ag Assessment. We take care of the Ag District. That way, there's no duplication of efforts. So what do we mean by we say protection from nuisance? Um, for many um, townships in Oswego County, uh, if you're out there making noise at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, you're probably going to get visited by law enforcement. However, a farmer may not have a choice. The only time he may be able to chop corn is 4 o'clock in the morning. If he's in the Ag District, he has no worries because those laws are superseded by the laws of the Ag District. So uh, it allows agriculture in Oswego County to do things that are regarded as best practices um, without any fear of reprisal or uh, anything negative that could happen from the community. So the Ag District is always in place uh, here in Oswego County. It's the Oswego County Agricultural District number 11. Um, there were, in fact, 11 ag districts. This is way before me. Um, and one by one, they were rolled into one. Why we didn't roll them into ag district number one, I don't know. But they've all been rolled in, and now we have ag district 11. There are not 10 other ag districts. Um, the ag district is, is in place every year. Once every eight years, it has to undergo a full review in agreement with regulations from New York State Ag and Markets. So we are in that process right now. We are actually coming towards the end of that process. Uh, within that process, we query all of the ag producers to ask if they are okay with being in the ag district. We allow those people who are not in the ag district to get in the ag district. And the most important thing is anybody who has a desire to get out of the ag district can only get out during the, the eight year review. So if you are in an ag district, uh, even if you buy a piece of property, which there's a lot of misunderstanding about that, but if you're in an ag district, the only way for you to get out of the ag district is during this review for once every eight years. According to New York State regulations, if a property is in the ag district, then that designation of being in the ag district remains through the sale of a property. So if you are buying property, the real estate agent is supposed to disclose to you that that property is in an ag district. That rarely happens, okay? We have many, many people that call us up that find out that they're in an ag district after they've already purchased the property. Sometimes it's a problem, sometimes it, uh, it's not a problem. Um, but we try to deal with those that we can. So getting out of the ag district once every eight years, you have to petition to do that. Um, I believe in your packets is the review of those people that are being put in. There's a very small number of people that want to come out. Uh, typically, 
it's people that want to come out because they want to build a house or they want to put an apartment building in. Um, there's some non-agricultural related um, project that they want to do. Uh, during this process, we've also discovered uh, an issue that I think we're going to deal with with education. That's what Cooperative Extension's mission is, education. We're not a service entity, we're an educational institution. So one of the things we've discovered is for a variety of different reasons, um, whether it's reviewing the ag assessment, whether it's somebody who sees that the property has been sold, uh, we have reason to believe that the assessors from individual towns are removing properties from the ag district. So we think it's an, ag, an educational thing. Um, so we're going to put on, uh, with Corey, Corey and I have been talking about doing this, we're going to put on uh, an educational session for the ag assessors throughout the county. Uh, only an act of the Oswego County Legislature can remove a property from the ag district. No one else has the right to take that property out of the ag district. Um, and we've gone through a number of cases um, where we've contacted somebody and they said, I'm already in the ag district. Uh, we go to the website, we look, no, they're not in the ag district. Um, and it's causing a lot of issues. Um, so we're going to do that. We'll try to correct it through education. Um, unfortunately, there's really not a way to lock down the website to do that, um, at least not as my understanding is. Um, so that will be forthcoming. So uh, next in the process is the public hearing, which will take place uh, during the uh, next legislative session, uh, which also, by the way, is June is dairy month. So we will be providing you with um, some milk and cheese as we do in, in, the, in the past. So you can look forward to that. Uh, but the public hearing is the next step. Assuming there are no objections in the public hearing phase, then the legislature will vote on that. Once that's complete, then the whole thing gets returned to Cooperative Extension. We write a report that we then bring back to the county for review to make sure they're comfortable with it. We send it on to Commissioner Ball for Ag and Markets. It takes them about two months to go through and do their review. Uh, during that time, we expect to get phone calls from them, which is pretty common. Um, and then eventually they sign off on it. Um, Betsy will get a copy of that sign off. It's sent to her automatically. We'll get a copy of that. Um, and so that's where we are. So we're, we're coming to the end of the, of the process. Um, it has not been bad this year. Um, in the previous eight year reviews, it's, some of it has been really tough. Um, this one has not been too bad. Um, and, and so we're, we're coming to the end and, and we should be all set. Okay. Anybody have any, yes? Were, were there any applications that were denied? This year, denied as in joining the agriculture. No, there were not. Now, in the past, there were. Um, this year, there were not. The Farmland Protection Board um, reviewed all the applications, and everything was good. Typically, what happens is we have people. Um, I'm not trying to be offensive. I don't know if I'm picking the right words. Please don't be offended. We have people who uh, have a desire to get into the ag district that maybe have. Um, a very junk, cluttered piece of property. And if they manage to get into the Ag District, then the code enforcement officer has nothing to say. He can't go there and say, remove these cars, remove these tractors. Um, he can't. If you're in the Ag District, that, that's considered to be part of farming. Um, so we have had those in the past uh, where we send people out. Um, the Farmland Protection Board, which is all volunteers, um, they will divvy those properties up and on their own time, they will go and look at those properties. Um, so we did have some in the past. We have not. <coughs> Nobody has been denied. Thank you. Um, where would someone wanted to see the entire list? That's over like a thousand, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Where yeah. could we see it, though? Uh, it's a it's database. Not, I mean, we could print it out for you. It's not on the website. No. It's not accessible. No, uh, no I mean, it's a public document. I mean, we could, we could, I mean, uh, Real property has it, and we have it. I mean, so it's available. You, you could probably just go downstairs and ask them to look at on a computer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's not published anymore. Okay, Mark. Well, this yeah. doesn't restrict somebody from building a home on their property uh, if they're they want to build a house for their child or something like that. Right. If the house, if the if the if the structure is going to be put up to support agriculture, then yes, there's not a problem. 
If somebody wants to build a house with the intention that they're going to sell it, they can't do that. Is there a minimum amount of acreage? Uh, to be in the ag district? Yeah. No. Because we have some that's just like a, a greenhouse type of thing. Yep. There's a minimum amount of, of acreage and a bunch of other hoops you have to jump through for the ag assessment, um, but not for any district. Austin? What if you buy a property that is in an ag district and you plan on developing it? Do you have to wait eight years yes, for that do. to come around? Yes, you do. Okay. And the problem with that, which is why we say that it's really the responsibility of the, of the real estate agent to disclose that, um, because the person, the entity that will defend that ag district will actually be New York State, because you're violating a New York State law. Do you every year have a slate of properties that come up, or is it all properties are looked at once every eight years? No. So every year, uh, again, you can't get out until the eight-year period, but every year there's an open enrollment period that goes from January 1st to January 30th. Anybody can apply to go in the Ag District at that time, but you can't come out until the eight-year review. Questions, comments? And they be what you were saying is that you would like to see a list of all of them that are in it so that if you're looking I can see what mm -hmm. you're thinking okay fine. okay here's the county and boy these lands could be nicely developed but if they're in an egg district you can't touch them, can't touch years, them. But right. so you but it would be good to know so site. that in eight years you might want to be yeah. looking at it so having some thing where it shows you what year it's in might you it's know. eight years. It's eight years. Doesn't make you. Yeah, it's, 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 oh. yeah, it's not a rolling thing. Oh. It's not a rolling thing. No. It's it's a set eight years. The entire county rolls oh. over oh, every eight years. eight years. In eight years. So not a rolling that property. Oh, isn't that, so the property if you don't remove that. your property this year, it doesn't make any difference it's where you are. Right. It's the next it's eight years. Okay. Oh, does it have to be the entire property? No. But you have to split it. Yeah. But you have to split it by tax ID. Subdivide it. Right. You have to subdivide it. What's the deadline? Tax ID. What's the timeline for what? For requesting to be removed. Like once mm -hmm. it's open, once you're in that eight years, is yeah. January first to January thirtieth. So it's too late for people to ask to be. It's too late now. Yeah, we did advertise it in the paper. We did have three separate listening sessions uh, that we rotated around the county. Um, two, we didn't have a lot of attendance, but the one in Granby was. There was a lot of people that came to Grand um, So uh, it's once every eight years, and the, to get in will be January 1st to January 30th next year if you want to get in. But if you want to get out, you got to wait until the next eight-year review. 2031. Yeah, 2031 is the next time you can get out. Correct. What if you subdivide parcels and create a new parcel that's not in the Ag District? I believe if the original parcel was in the Ag District, then all subsequent parcels will be in there until the eight-year review. But I'm not, I'm not sure on that. I'd have to find out. One last question. Yeah. Does it? It doesn't prevent you from farming if you pull out of the Ag District. It just doesn't. Prevent no. You. It does. It does not prevent you from doing anything you want to do. Right. The only thing is, it does not give you any protection against um, what we call nuisance issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, you have no protection. And we do have people to do just what you're talking about. We have people that wait for the eight year because they have a piece of property that somebody has approached them and said, hey, I'd like to do something with that. And so they section that off, and that property comes out, but the main property remains in. Yep. And everybody that is in the egg district received a letter. Absolutely. Saying, if you want out, you got to do it now. Absolutely. We sent out, I want to say, close to 1,100 letters. Yeah. So I've had a lot of questions, a lot of comments. And like I said, we did have three listening sessions, you know, where people could come for work sessions, you know, bring your tax IDs and how much and we'll go through it. Yeah. So okay. any other questions for Paul? Rich? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I was trying not to disclose you. So this is on you. Go ahead. No, oh, it's on you. <laughs> My question is very simple and uh, the years ago, the, the big farm was subdivided off of the frontage. Okay. And I own all the property around this development. Uh, my neighbors are aging out. Okay. 
and I can't get the real estate company to even answer the phone to me. They're not disclosing the owners of these places, because they don't know, because I've been there forever. My dad was there before me. They don't know this is a nag district. And the problem is, I'm the one that has to be sitting there, I get the brunt of it at first, why are you spreading the out here? Because I can, that's why. And of course, that, because I want to know who's going to hold these people accountable. Yeah, I, I wish I had an answer. Because, I need an answer. Yeah, one of the biggest complaints we have is, seriously, is people who have purchased, typically what happens is we have people that purchase land and then they try to file for a permit or they want to do building or they want, and then somehow they find out that they're in the Ag District. They don't even know what the Ag District is and they come to us with their hair on fire. You know, I don't want to be in this, how do I get out? Well, you well I'm, not, I'm talking about something better because of the fact that I have the houses around my farm. Yeah, then they have nothing to say. I mean, if you're in the Ag District, but they got a letter. No, 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 no. I got the letter. No, you I, got the letter. I have the farm. My point is that but the those houses, properties are still in the district. There's, there's 19 houses there. around my farm. Or the property I so own. he's saying that they got a letter too. Uh, no, the only way no, you get the letter goes in the Ag district. You have to be in the Ag district to contact. Oh, oh, oh. Well, are you just saying, Rich, that you're upset because they're complaining? I'm not that. upset about money because I come, well, you know what I can tell. Why well, I can admit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can get right to the point. <laughs> and, and he was also, and I didn't want to disclose, but I will not. He was also one of the people who called us up and said, I'm already in the Ag district. And we looked at on his files and, no, you're not. Now, who took him out of the Ag district? We certainly didn't do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, so that's why I'm saying it's, it's, it's an issue. We have to deal with this because you can't just take somebody out of the Ag district. Only the Swigo County, by act of legislature, Legislative uh, uh, agenda can somebody take them out of the end because you can't just you can only do it at the end of the eight years or can you do it at any point? No, no, at, at the eight years. Well, it sounds like a meeting needs to happen with all the assessors. Yeah, we're going to do an education yeah. session. Yeah, uh, Real Property and I have, have, dis have decided we're going to do that. Probably include Joe just for fun. Yeah. So, <laughs> just give me some extra to do. Well, well, yeah. uh, the eight years that's at my state law. It's it's every eight years. So we've done one state law. I, 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 the eight the eight year period is state law. It's rolling for other counties, but ours is the path is already set. But yes, it's every eight years. So a change it will take an act of the state. Oof, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't know how to change that. Because yeah, the concern, concerns are um, uh, in Southern Park the County, if there's going to be development from Micron, are these people? Included from selling their property yeah. for yeah. alternative development. Mm -hmm. yeah. so right now, so we would need an act to state make this clear to them, though. Actually, we should. I, I think we should take the time to make this clear to everybody that they will not be able to develop if they keep it in the ag district before we go ahead with this forward. Is the date by which you have to but ask need to, know. to be removed is that a date set by the county? Or <coughs> it's, a date? it's a date set by us with what we told the county, with what we told the state we were going to do. Yeah. So we could so there is we extend that date. Oh, I don't know. I'd have to ask them because we have. You remember we had our initial meeting. We contacted yeah. Bag and Markets and said, "This is our path. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this." Because they're expecting by the end of July, early August, they're expecting our final report. Austin, you have concerns? Uh, I mean, if I saw the list and I could cross-reference it with properties that are in the southern end of the county, yeah. I mean, it's a problem. I know with, at least with ours, we never received any letters, so I know that we're not for the 185 acres that the IDA bought, but that, that, that land is farmed, so you know, it just makes me wonder a little bit, is that, that land that's farmed in an ag district or is that land that's just farmed? So here again lies the same problem we were just talking about with him. The only way that, that that property would have appeared on the list that Corey would have generated is if that box was checked. Sure. So if somebody unchecked that box, then we wouldn't get that list. I'm but not people, saying it is. I'm just yeah. it just puts a little doubt in my mind. Yeah. I gotta look yeah. at that now. I you know, a real but, property. Yeah, yeah. I, would I guess that. if you go to real property, is it listed? If you go to real property tax service and you look up properties on there, does it state on the actual 
form for each in the website that it's in an ag district yes. or do you have to go to when them you, and look at a when roll? you bring up a page okay. for each parcel yes there's a box like the right side center of the page okay. that says in ag district okay if the box is checked then they're in the ag district okay yes all right i mean that's what we go by but as i said you, you, I mean, we have people taking them sure you know taking stuff out of the ag district all over the place so richard how'd you find out couldn't someone put them back in uh, the list? Like I said, my my neighbors are aging out. Right. And there's younger people coming in, or people from people from metropolitan areas, let's put it politely. Right. 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 And when they see me out there spread manure up along the property line, because I have the right to do it and I take the A off of that. Right. And they come out and they start yelling, screaming and howling, and of course then I you know and <laughs> I take care of that problem. When did you right. find when did you find out you weren't in? You called us after I got called them because in fact oh, I have three parcels, for example, that are in one area. Yeah. Well, one of them's in the ag district. Well, maybe two of them. I can't remember. But one of them isn't. And that was in South Carolina. When they called me, they wanted me to send this and send that. And I said, I'm not here. I'm not going down to South Carolina. What do you want me to do? I want me back for two weeks. The thing is, um, let, whoever's going to accuse me better be able to prove it. And where the property line is like that, because like I said, there's one feet it'd be like walking this table to this table. This table is one thing, this table isn't, yet I work them off. So if I want to find out, because I I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I did hook it out or not, just the way to find out is just go to just go to real property. Yeah, just go to real property. Look up your parcel. Look up your parcel on the on the internet. <laughs> if that box is checked, then it's in the act. Okay. I, I would argue that, that this complete list needs to be patched to our resolution because we're, we're saying that these people are mandated to stay in after the state. Basically, yes. For the public hearing, that should be posted with the resolution. I don't think we should have to go down to real property to look up a list of what, who's on this and who's not. Yeah, the you, know, you don't want it in the packet. I mean, we've done that before. We're, the packet was like 48 pages. Yeah, so it should be listed on the website. Yeah, the website. It's like it's seven. It's it website. should be available. To, we're going to have a public hearing about Wait, this. We, it should we, be on the Yeah. It should be available. When you agree. So somebody needs to I'm sure it. Corey can run a list. Yeah, Corey can run a list. Well, he can run a list, but it's not going to be a 48 page packet. It'll just run the list. Yeah, but it's going to be, it's going to be all thousand names. There's a lot of one people. With, yeah. with the, whatever data he brings with it. Right. But if it's just okay. name and location. Well, it'll be, just trying to think it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be about 700 names, but it's about 1,100 parcels. I can really want to present this conversation. I may want to pull my parcel out. Yeah. But it's too late. No, it's not too late. The resolution hasn't passed yet. We haven't passed the resolution yet. It's not too late. Well, it depends on you where can't, you can't set something that's going on public hearing. Public hearing hasn't taken place yet. Yeah. Well, in, in by law, yeah. by January. right, but by law, if we have a public hearing and if there's questions, don't we have to reset the public hearing again? Well, I'm, I'm going to call, just yeah. what Phil said. I'm going to call Ag and Markets when I get back and ask, is this written in stone? Yeah, but you that's know. what I'm saying. But by our law, though, if we have questions at the public hearing, doesn't that mean if we want to change it? It has to go to another yeah, public hearing. Um, so if you have a public hearing, you have a public hearing. I think you can't. You can't uh, and I thought that was brought up before. Hearing. If we change a public hearing, that means we have to go to the following month. So if you're adding or detracting from the list, yeah. 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 Especially with yeah. Micron yeah. coming, I think this is a, a much bigger picture than just whether or not you want to be in the There's Rich right there. Uh, Rich, if you had a time. public <laughs> hearing on the Ag Districts, you if, 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 if after the pub, during the public hearing, it comes up that there are additional properties to be take, added or to be taken off, can we do that there or do we have to reschedule a public hearing with a complete amended? I have to look at the Ag and Markets Law C yeah. okay. because uh, we we have had requests to include parcels in the Ag District, uh, the garage that had been built and there's a sheep in it that was in the village that was removed. <laughs> you know, but uh, we said it was not. That was eight years ago. Yeah, right. Was right. So we have had requests, but we didn't re notice the hearing on, on that. Do we take the Ag and Markets Law? It's, it's different than a local law, so we have to talk. I'll have to find out also because there's a requirement that whatever. Whatever is going to advance to the legislature 
has to go through the farmland protection so that's, board. That's where it starts. Right. So, so if we're making all these changes, I think the farmland protection board probably has to meet again yeah. to do the changes. There's also timelines on filing the ag district, yeah. so um, that may not be possible to have additional parcels considered. In, okay, this I hope. Are those timelines state law or are they local law? That's what he's going to find out. Yeah, we, had, we had to file. We had an initial meeting and we filed our plan that this is what we were going to do. For example, we had a final roll of July 1 for, for, next, for assessment purposes for next year. And uh, if the district's not set by then, it would be a problem. Well, that's, that has nothing to do with the assessments. No, no, no but the district's, the, if the roles are set, then it includes which parcels are in the district and which are not in the district. So. Um, so it doesn't affect the value it's whether or not you're in the district. So I'd have to look at that in marketing. Yeah. So I, how many parcels are being changed? Well, we don't we don't know. We're we're yeah. we're, we're discussing <coughs> that many of the people in the ag district may not have uh, thought about the possibility of development in the southern end when they just decided they were going to stay in. Stay in another eight years before they have an opportunity to sell. We're trying to think whether we ought to, you know, well, they can sell something. Have that conversation. How's that something up? Well, because they can't sell for other people. In light of this new information, I certainly would like to pull my property out of this. Yeah, it might be other people, Rich. Yeah, just one more quick thing, and that's because I lived there, was born and raised there. County Route 10, as most of you may or may not know, runs from Swivel Springs all the way to Route 49. The majority of that property, the majority of it, probably 80% of it, is under a, a district. That means we can put sewer and water and everything else down through there. Those people are not going to be able to have houses built on that property. Keep that in mind. That's, a, that's, a, that's an anchor on our their ear. They're doing anything. So, a good conversation. This, this, this is a big impact. From 49 to 31. So I feel compelled to make a statement here. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Robert yeah. Extension is just doing its job. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I don't want everybody. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden we're going to walk out of here. <laughs> Damn, Robert Extension! Look what they did. No. We're just doing our job. No, I think we need to find out if there is an opportunity for people to pull. And if it is, yeah, I'll we'll call them. I will contact them as soon as I get back. Yeah, we have yeah, to. Well, we have to find out who yeah. else wants out. Yeah. Is yeah. basically. Okay, gotta inform the people. Let them know where. Well, see, they are, but I think the problem yeah, is that people get a you get a piece of paper. Oh, I want to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Not even thinking. Wait a minute. This means you cannot develop. You might run out there. You might want to consider if you're going to have building lots. Cause right. Because if you got to out, out, you know, if that was the the case, you got out. Two years later, nothing happened. You never developed your property. You could come getting back, back in. in is, no you know, Betsy and I work on that every year. Yeah, you know, it's no big deal about getting it in. It's right. the getting out. Right. And I think a lot of people, when they read it, and Austin, I think he went into a, a plexi back there. He was like, <laughs> 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 yeah, he was couldn't even yeah. think there. He's probably not a so, I mean, I think really we need to look to see if there is an opportunity for a little bit more information if people want to get out. Because this could I sold, I sold half my daughter to look this up. Yeah, I want, yeah. I want out if I can get out. If it's, if it's, if it's yeah. possible we'll to get out at this okay, point. Okay, motion to adjourn and <laughs> seconded. Okay, guys, interesting meeting.